hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Anu Pradhan. I work at HCSC. And uh, with me is Jeff Shrank from uh, Pivotal. And uh, we're just going to talk to you about uh, the ETL process. Uh, we uh, were writing an API and uh, using the microservice architecture. So we use uh, Gemfire as our data source. And so we had to move our data from our uh, traditional uh, source system, which was uh, a, data, a relational database, into Gemfire. And we went to the data team and they said, you know, it's going to take you six months to get move all the data up. And I'm like, oh my god. We're writing microservices. We want to be agile. We want to move it up. So what do we do? So they said, well, it's, your, it's up to you. Go ahead, and if you can move the data quickly, do it. So at the same time, uh, Mike actually was at HCSE, and he gave us a demo on Spring Cloud Stream. So we said, you know, that's something we can use. It's Spring-based. It's Java. You know, that's what we know. We don't know the traditional ETL tools, data states. It'll take us a long time to learn. So let's try this one. And we were able to get all our data out uh, in like a few months. And so we thought we would uh, you know, share it with you, our success story of what we did to do this. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. This is my first time in public speaking. So <laughs> just bear with me. So what is traditional ETL? So typically, uh, you know, you're, you don't want uh, uh, the reporting and analytics to go against your source systems. So you make a copy of your data and move it over to uh, another a source so where you can do reporting, you can run your queries, which won't bog down your source systems. So when you're doing reporting, you really don't need real-time data. It's so that most of the ETL t uh, processes are batch. Um, you know, they run in the night. Um, so uh, they don't want you to bog your source system. So they say you run it in off hours. So with all the new uh, processing, you, the, uh, the time for running the batch processes is shrinking. So now you have a smaller window to move your data. So for that, if you have to move a large quantity of data, you have to use high CPU processing power so you can quickly move all that data. And as I mentioned, you know, the ETL process, they told us to take six, it would take us six months to develop the whole process to move the data into Gemfire. So uh, same thing with the skill set. Like, I didn't know how to use data stage. So same thing, once you uh, have the data moved over, you have to tra transition it to ops. Now, they also have to learn the tool to uh, manage your data. So, oops, sorry. So what are our new needs? So we wanted, we cannot have stale data. We are writing APIs, which are going to give you information to the end user. So they, it has to be real time. If the change is made in the source system, we need it uh, to be available right away into, into Gemfire. So our APIs can expose that data out. <clears throat> we need it to scale out. So as you know, uh, HCS is an insurance company. So during enrollment time, there's huge volume of data. The, we get new members. So the data changes, so we need the system to scale uh, at that time and then scale down during the non-enrollment time. Testing this large amount of data. We have millions of members. So a uh, lot of times when you're uh, testing in small quantities, it works fine, but then when you're working with millions of records, uh, it fails. So we need the system to be able to, uh, we should be able to test it with large amount of data and agile, right? Uh, Things change, business changes, your data requirements change. So we should be able to quickly uh, change and uh, adapt to whatever the new data needs are. So let's talk about what the ETL process is. So you have a source system, you have a destination system. You want to move your data. So you put some ETL process in between. So with a traditional ETL system, you would extract a file, get it out, and then you use that file extract and then move your data out. So that's going to be a batch process. It's not going to be real time. So the other option you have is to use <coughs> events. With the event-based system, as the data is changing your source system, you can record events into an event table. And then using those metadata, you should be able to, uh, we can easily move the data across. So let's go a little deeper into what the detail process would be. So here's my event table. The source system, <coughs> As the data changes, the, the key information of what the data changed, 
we would record into the event table. And then ETL process will read those events. And as it reads, it's going to change saying, oh, I read this row. So it's going to update the status, move it out. So now I have the metadata of the data that I need to change uh, and that I need to extract. So the extract process will go to the source DB and extract the data based on that metadata, transform it into my what my target system needs, and then load it into the target system. It's good, but what I have to do, I have to manage the state as I'm reading the data. So I have to sequentially process them, because if I start uh, doing multi-threading, then it, I may run into an issue where I may read the same records again and again. So. Uh, Plus, when I'm reading from a database, my IO, typically IO operations are slower. So you don't want to just read one row at a time. Like if I have 5 million rows or 15 million rows, if I'm reading one by one, it's going to take a long time. So I want to read the events in a batch. So if I read an event in a batch, I can multi-thread my, the, the, dark, the extract, transform, and load process. I can multi-thread it and then take that batch, say 1,000 rows, multi-thread into 1,000 threads, and then send it across. But then, I mean, I have millions of rows that I need to move. So it's not going to really scale in one JVM. So now I have to add more instances. But when I add more instances, I, don't, I cannot really read fr uh, from all of those instances because then I may read the same rows again. So I still have a problem. So let's go into a different approach. So let's break it out. So I'm going to break, I broke out the uh, read aspect into another instance, and then the extract and transform becomes its own process. And then again, back into my uh, destination, which is again an IO, I can aggregate it and then do a big uh, batch push into that. So now we break it out. So now the advantage we get with this is I can independently scale. So I can have only one instance of the read. I can have multiple instances of transform another one instance or more instances depending upon how I can batch it because I'm still going to read from a messaging queue and then put it into my target system. <clears throat> so now I have a good microservice architecture uh, using a messaging middleware. I wouldn't want to use REST APIs because then it will become a synchronous process. So I'm going to keep it on a messaging middleware. So do, I really, do we really want to write all this process with mess messaging middleware? No. We actually have a framework which Mike had come and explained to us was Spring Cloud Stream. So what does Spring Cloud Stream give us? It actually, oh, I think I went a little further up. Yeah. So Spring Cloud Stream actually is a framework that is, uh, provides microservice-oriented architecture over a message, messaging platform. So it gives us, uh, it gives an abstraction layer. I don't have to worry about how I bind to the messaging middleware, it takes care of it for you. It gives you out-of-box configuration for writing, uh, reading data from different sources like JDBC or HDFS or file source. It is cloud-native friendly, so I can deploy it on any of the cloud platforms. And it also, because now it's more of a microservices architecture, I can use continuous integration and continuous delivery. The CI has any pipeline for it. I can independently test my components. So I can independently have unit tests for the source aspect. I can, have, I can have a contract between what my source is going to send to my processor. So I can test my processor independently. I can test my sync independently. So I don't have to test the entire flow each time I make a change. So I can just change wherever I need to make a change. So like, <clears throat> I have a change in the business and I need a different way for my data to come, I can just change my processor, can test it, and just deploy the processor. So now how does it look? So with that uh, framework, so now I'm using a messaging framework, so my reading events became actually a source component. The extract and transform became my processor component, and then loading into the target became a sync component. Now, everything is good if it's a happy part, but it's never a happy part. You have errors. So how do you handle errors? So Spring Cloud Stream also gives you out-of-the-box error handling mechanism. So you can have error queues. So if there is any error while doing, reading the source or if I'm doing, uh, while doing the processing, it dumps it into the error queue. 
And <coughs> to keep it automated, I can write a sync process, which will read from the error queue based on what the error was. It can update the status code in there. So the way we have done it, <coughs> if we have any issues, depending upon what it is, if it's a recoverable error, like something was down, and if I retry, it would go again. So we can just, the sync process would just put the status back as 10, and then it gets reprocessed again. But if it's something which needs a manual intervention, then we would put it with a different status code, then somebody can go and check it. Same thing, flexibility. So uh, today we are getting data from only one source. But depending upon my line of business, I may have different source system for the different line of business. So I can still reuse the same, uh, most of the process. So I can have, a, say, a comment format in between uh, my transform layer into the target. Then I can have different source systems processing and putting into that common format. And then from there onwards, I can reuse the process. So you can easily extend it to different kinds of things that you want to do. So let's look a little bit about what we did with the uh, event, design, event table. So we tried to make it as simple and generic, because I'm not just moving, we are not just moving one table at a time. We are moving a chunk of uh, data which corresponds to multiple tables. We want to have an event ta a table design that can span across multiple different data sets. So we have a simple uh, table design. So we have the source ID for us, since it was a relational database. The metadata is just one key, the source ID, but you may have a compound key. So the first, two, first column can correspond to whatever is your compound key. Second one is the function unit, so depending upon what chunk of data you're going to read. So in, in our demo, we are actually using a customer order system. So our function units are customer and order. Status code is where, what I'm starting off, like 10 is I'm going to start off. It's not processed yet. And then you can have 70 when it's fully processed. In between status 45 and things like that, which will be like error codes. Action code, what am I doing with that data? Am I adding it or deleting it? And then we also had an additional one called attempt count. So if you had ish errors, like I was not able to put onto a message in queue because the message queue was full or something. So in that case, I can uh, have a status code of a 45, which can get reprocessed, but I don't want to keep reprocessing all the time, so I have an attempt count. So we have a process where we say if it's my attempt count is more than three, then I'm going to stop. I'm not going to keep retrying it, so it doesn't go into a loop. So finally, this is how our full end-to-end -end ETL process looks. So from a source uh, table, we actually use uh, CDC, which is a change data capture. It's an IBM tool or uh, data mirror. So we are using that that scrapes the logs and creates the event into the event table. And then from there onwards, we are using uh, Spring Cloud Stream to move the data around. Now, with using the event table, we got one more advantage. For initial load, I don't have to write a new process because I can use a synthetic uh, event generator that will scan the table and put all the keys for my initial load into the event table and then just reprocess it. So it's the same process for incremental load or initial load. That I don't have to write any new different process. And then finally, if you go back here, if you look at it, there are a lot of components that you have to work with. So you don't really want to manage them yourself. So there, there we go, is we got Spring Cloud Foundry. So it allows us, uh, gives us RabbitMQ, the messaging middleware, out of the box for us. Uh, we don't need additional skill set for products. Scaling, Cloud Foundry has auto-scaling. We can set our KPIs, and it can auto-scale and scale down for us. Gives our auto-recovery. So remember, we said the source was going to be just one instance. So if it goes down, it automatically comes back off. We don't have to worry about it. Uh, gives us monitoring, and then we are able to use CI/CD pipeline to do our deployments. And Jeff will do the demo. Thank you, Anu. Thank you. Thank you. All right, can everyone hear me? All right. Good. So. Uh, we just talked about Spring Cloud Stream, and thanks to Mike, you have a, a very good introductions. 
where we talk about spring cloud streams, spring cloud tests, and spring cloud data flow. But uh, I'm going to do a little bit demo on how we actually implement this ETL process. Uh, let me bring that, this one up. So how many people uh, in the audience actually used the Spring integration before? Quite a few. Probably, used, uh, how about Spring Cloud Stream? A anyone tried it before? No? Okay. So Mike said batch is sexy. I think integration process is sexy. <laughs> All right. So we'll go back to the, the previous design diagram about the source, processor, and sync, right? So in our demo, we're going to show how to implement a very simple JDBC source and very simple JDBC processor and a sync to Geo. So Geo is basically the open source implementation for Gemfire. That's what Anu was mentioned. Um, so before I do that, um, we have application actually running on PCF. On my local machines, I don't trust the internet and stuff like that. So I have a PCF running on my local machines that will be able to deploy the app and be able to do the demos. And I'm using the um, MySQL available with the PCF dev to try to do some testing. So over here, I have a schema. I have a set of schema of customer item, customer orders. And they are one to many and many to many relationship that's already been defined. So I'm going to have those tables ready, and I'm going to run it. Basically, drop off my table, recreate, the, recreate everything. And I'm going to have a set of data over here. So before I start to do the um, migration, so I'm going to show flow. Just show the flow and end result first. So I'm going to stop my source applications. So it's not going to pick up from the database. All right, I'll stop it. Now I'm going to insert all the data in there, right? And also creating a synthetic record. That's simulating that I have synthetic record, the CDC has not been created, if I want to do initial data load and stuff like that. Then you can enable the triggers over here. So now we should have all the data available in the regular table. Thank you. So I have customer, I have two customers available in my uh, source systems. So I have a system up and running, which is Geo uh, on my local machines. And I'm going to select, I'm going to try to do a select data from the table. Right now I got nothing. Awesome. So, I'm going to start my pipeline, which will sync the data from the source systems. Uh, source, process, and sync. I'm going to let it get up and running. <coughs> so, one good thing is about Cloud Foundry, uh, uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry, is there's a good UI interface that you can quick stop and start and testing things very easily, uh, very quickly quick turnaround time, quick feedback. So now I have customers. It's coming here, uh, two customers load it up. So I'm gonna show you how that's actually being implemented. Uh, and it's actually very uh, simple implementations. Uh, hopefully, uh, when you go back to, to your workplace, if you find this project to be interested, feel free to take it and implement however you feel like to. So Spring Cloud Stream has a lot of out-of-box components. Uh, so for example, how to read from file systems, how to read from, go ahead. Can you increase the font just a little bit? Sure, let me try to see how to do that. Anyone can give me a hint on where to go? Search for fonts. Search for font. And the preferences. All right. Good. Looks good. 
So we have uh, a source. So like I said, uh, Spring Cloud Stream has modules, hollow box module that can be able to read from file system, be able to read from JDBC, and probably can connect to emails and so on and so forth. The one that we're interested in is actually the one that can read from JDBC. So for demo purpose, I actually forked the project. There's something called, something, uh, uh, there's a GitHub out there. It's called Spring Cloud Stream Starter. Uh, applications where you can go in there and take a look how it's actually being implemented. But if you want to, you can, you can uh, by following the documentation, you just use it as a out of box. For demoing purpose, I have forked the, the, the code. The code is very simple. Uh, it's based off uh, Spring Boot uh, and using Spring integrations. So you can do your JDBC source and stuff like that however you want to, then be able to uh, access the uh, available component from Spring integrations. I'm not going to dive into this code. It's just available out of pass and forking it uh, because I need to do some kind of integration test on my local machines. Then you can actually, for any component, any Spring Cloud Stream modules, when you, when you write it, this, this, the good things about Spring Cloud Stream is you write a code without worry about the infrastructure. So Spring, uh, Spring Cloud Stream is based off Spring Boot, Spring Integration and Spring Cloud. So there's a lot of abstractions already been taken care of by the framework. So when I'm writing the code, I just want to focus on business rules. Then you can, let, you can have additional wrappers on top of it to say I want to deploy into Cloud Foundry and I need to be able to talk to different message middleware and so on and so forth. Now you can configure by the application itself. So for example, I have an application in here. It's just a very simple Spring Boot app that Need, uh, need to go to work on the, um, that has a dependency injections uh, and also component scan on this, this particular package. Then you will find whatever the configuration you defined for your uh, modules. So here is the configuration where you have all the modules. Let me minimize this way so it's better to read. So you can have module defined, let's say I have JDBC JDBC uh, message source, I have a, a Spring integration flow, and they have been there all the while to define configurations. Within this package, then you can have your application just be able to component scan, Spring Boot application component scan it. But I will say, my Spring Cloud Stream need to be able to use either RabbitMQ or Kafka. By the way, Spring Cloud Stream binder, there's something called uh, a binder, which in, when you write your application, you don't have to worry about which message middleware you are going to work with. Your code is simple, just business rules. But when you deploy, your module need to know, should I work with RabbitMQ, or should I work with Kafka, or potentially other message middleware? So that's where you can actually define your, uh, define the actual configurations by providing different binder uh, class available on the class path. So for example, you can have, you can say, my component need to work with Kafka, then you put this one on the class path, or I need to work with RabbitMQ, you put on this class path. Spring Cloud Stream is also very flexible. Uh, let's say you're gonna have a processor. That might be taking the message from Kafka, then I want to output to RabbitMQ. It's also capable of doing that, and just need to put two binders on the class path and do configurations as, uh, for the environment variable when you deploy it. I will show how that's been done. And because I want my application to be able to deploy to the uh, Cloud Foundry, so I want to be able to use the, the, the service connectors and the uh, Cloud Foundry connector available uh, on my class path. So if I deploy my app, I can automatically find the available servers on the Cloud Foundry. So I'm doing separation of concern. My modules is generic. The source module core is generic. The configuration by itself is generic. When I deployed it, I have an application wrap on top of it, and I define necessary palms, uh, necessary dependencies, and how I want to connect to it. So here is where you can enable the binding to really specific spelling out to say, my module, the output, the output of my source module need to bind to RabbitMQ. You do that configurations outside of your code, so you don't have to worry. Those configurations in your code is very good. So the source module is really looking at JDBC. You need to look at the event tables, and then need to generate a meta event down to the processor. 
So the processor can, based on the meta, the, the meta information from the event, then do whatever it has to do. So the source is really good at query. Uh, we want to make sure when we query the event, it doesn't, uh, it handles the duplicates proper, right? So we, don't want, we do not want to send duplicate records. We only care about, for any given event, we care about the latest one, right? And then we have some kind of status code that is, is, can be able to configure to say, well, what event qualifies for uh, moving downstream process? So after you get an event, you want to say, you have to turn around and to say, I read the event already. So this, there's two properties. One is query, how you query the event. And after you query the event, how you want to go back and, and change it so you do not query it again. Then you can say, you can tune it. You can say for my, my processor, right? for, uh, sorry, for my source, how big of a batch I want to query for the event, how, how big of a chunk I want to do. So you can, you can tune it, you can try, try to uh, improve your performance either by throughput or latency and stuff like that. So the bigger the, bigger the pool you pull, uh, you, have, you will have better throughput, but potentially uh, slower latencies. I mean, I mean uh, the, 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 you have throughput and response time. So basically response time could be impacted. Right? So this is the source. Then I need to have a processor. Uh, an event meta inf information is sent to the processor. I need to have a processor to be able to pick up the, the code and be able to work on it. So this is the, the one that actually start to get interested. So processor, I'm going to, so this is something called the binding interface. So Spring Cloud Stream has a concept of binding interface. So we're talking about the source, processor, and sync. Those has a generic uh, binding interface out of box. You can define your own binding interface. You can call it, say, JDBC event processor, and it's a binding interface that has some input, has some output. If you want to say my processor wants to have four or five output to output to different queues, you can actually define it over here as well. So you define a binding interface, right? And then in the processor configurations, you say enable binding. This configuration will be used We'll be using the uh, binding process that you defined, and which will have the abstractions of the, the, the input and output. So your module focuses on abstraction. What's my input? What's my output? Where does the input is, is wired? I don't care. How does my output is wired? I don't care. I'm going to let framework to take care of that for me. So in this, it's very simple. It can work with Spring integration flow. I have a, a very simple uh, integration flow over here to say, this flow will take the message from the input of the processor. And I want to do some kind of handling. I want to do something, I'm going to pass into the, the handler. Then after the handler is, is, is done transformation or whatever it has to do, send the output from that handler to the output channel. Then do get flow. Simple definitions, nothing special, right? And then we have a message handler over here. So what does this message handler do? It basically say, I'm going to take a message. Right? I'm going to uh, message. I'm going to expect certain uh, certain information, meta information coming out from that payload. So those are the payload actually coming out from the the source module. The source module will query the event. The event will return those uh, with the actual value for. The, the, the group, the key, action code, and so on and so forth. So I also want to take some meta information about the timestamp. I'm not going to put those stuff into the, the headers, the actual message header. I prefer to send those meta information as a part of message header, and the actual payload is the content I care. So the downstream process or downstream modules, when they pick up the message, they will be able to use the header information to do additional correlations, to do additional uh, business logic if needed. So we are not going to lose those data. Then one interesting part is I have meta information, but I need to use the meta information and go back to the uh, actual database to query the actual data, to do necessary joins if there are multiple tables, and then to get actual event. So the good things about this design is you are not going to do full table scan uh, based on timestamp or anything like that, because the event table will give you the key. And you use the, the key identifier or, or some field that's probably indexed and unique and stuff like that. You go back to the actual table when you do the join. You're going to have a make sure that you have really good join and then your, your where clause, only thing that's dynamic is your key. So it's, it's get, it's very quick. 
the, the query can, the re response time should be really quick. Uh, but I want my process, my module, to be able to work with uh, different query, or I want it to be extendable. So today you're going to have uh, a, a flow, uh, ETL flow, working for customer cable. Tomorrow I might want to do inventory, or the day after I want to do, I don't know, uh, shipping record or, or stuff like that. So I want my flow to be dynamic. So I'm going to allow the DL to be, to, to be as as I'm doing the runtime. So that's why where we introduced uh, something called processor extensions. So this is the, anything in the process core is very generic. So if you look at the configurations, very simple flow, very wiring, have process handler, process handler say I need to talk to DAO, but where does DAO come from, right? We need to wire it. Uh, then really nothing else in the core. So then we provide extensions. Then the, in the extensions, we have uh, extractors. So let me pull up a actual common code. Give me a second hold here. So there is something common over here. So this is generic DAO code. Very simple DAO using JDBC operations, uh, basically a Spring JDBC template approach. Uh, so what it's going to take is I'm going to take a key. So this is something that you might have to customize. Because a key, for our example, our, our key is basically say we have one column of key, and just use that value to do, uh, to do a selection. But your key might be composite key. So which means your key, the single column value return, you might want to be able to parse it. You can use common delimiter or whatever. So you, you might be able to provide a key extractor over here to say, I have a string of key, but how do I want to extract it? So this is parameter-based JDBC operations. You just give a SQL, you give you a parameter map, and somehow you need to be able to extract it. So uh, Spring JDBC provides the result side extractor interface that you can implement against. So again, generic DAO, then I need to provide actual concrete implementation for my result side extractor. And what is my SQL? So then over here at the extensions, we're going to provide a configurations. That can be component scanned. And we're going to read from uh, a SQL files, a file that's, you know, it, this is basically you can externalize your SQL without writing to your code, right? Uh, we're going to have three DAOs, uh, one is for a customer, one for item, one for customer order, right? Uh, data source, so the, uh, the, the database connection can be uh, dependency injected and stuff like that. So our SQL is actually available over here. Very simple. You say select star from customer where ID equals source key. Same thing for the items. Now, here is because the customer order. I have, I, I have a customer, I have items. So customer order is actually um, the representation of um, many to many. So then I have to do some kind of join. Uh, so you can say slice star from customer order in the join, the order items, um, ID, and then where ID equals this. So now what you're getting is, in my database, let me show the schema just a little bit. In my database, I have customer item, customer order, and order items. This many tables. However, when I move from one data storage to another data storage, you want to do some kind of demonalizations. You want to do some kind of uh, uh, rearrange of the objects. So let's say you move from traditional database to uh, NoSQL, like key value paired, which is Java based, which is an object graph. So now you can use your, tran your transformer or your processor to do that kind of transformation of creating a final Java object that you might be care that you want to send to downstream. So here's my SQL and here's my denormalizations. So once I have SQL, I want to be able to transform it. So you can have a result set, uh, uh, result set uh, extractor of try to extract, right? I have customer order payload uh, that's based on uh, the, those attributes to be set it up. I will create the payload, I will send downstream. So simple implementations for all the result set extractors, right? Now, if you are doing TDD, this is actually a good place to, to say, I want to introduce a new business rules, uh, I want to do testing-driven development and stuff like that. So you should be able to write a test first. 
that you don't really care about anything else. Just focus on your test. Create your test and make, make sure that um, everything is working. So we can actually, for example, can say run us, tune the test, and all the tests should pass. And you can, if you want to add more module, working on more tables, you can keep extending on this without touching the core. So now to wire all of them together, you can have the, the processor app. So even processor app. Again, I want to be able to bind it with either Kafka or RabbitMQ, and I'm going to use my YAML file to define what's the actual binder want to be with the uh, Cloud Foundry connectors. Then I would say I need the process core, I need the processor extensions, right? And then here is a manifest, very simple, showing the examples on how to create data to queue and how to configure the concurrencies, how many times you want to retries, and I, I, you can have options of binders for input and output. So this is where you can change. I can change to say rabbit, I can change to Kafka, so on and so forth. Then here is the the actual the the destination the, the physical names of the the the, the, the topics or queues you want to create on the real message middleware. And I will show you uh, for uh, after uh, a little bit later. Now I have a sync. So the sync is basically I want to I have object gets created, send it to the sync, which which then I need do further transformation and save to geo, which is key valued. So a lot of the time, most, a lot of challenge that we are facing for ETL, uh, especially when we're talking about real-time ETL, right? It's about delta change and or how to handle delete and how to handle the, the ordering of events. Uh, so you don't have, let's say you have one record, customer one, that has creating an order he, he feel wrong, he delete the orders, and then right, he orders something else again, and he changed the items in the order, and so on and so forth. So those event, ordering of the event, uh, sometimes can have an impact of how you write to your destination, because you want to make sure the final, final result at the destinations is consistent to whatever just happened. So we want to make sure that the, the, the delete process, so for the, uh, Key value kind of storage. Really, you only care about two types of event, right? It's either insert, it's basically update, like put, or remove. I don't care about insert. I don't care about anything. I just care about if there's a data, I put. If there's no data, I do remove. So you can construct your SQL, your select statement, to be very simple, to say, I select something. If I don't get anything based on that ID, which means it's a delete event, right? And I need to send the meta information necessary downstream to, to, to tell it's a delete event. Now, if I actually get something, I don't care. I don't care the delta change. I basically select the whole thing. And I send downstream so it's a whole replacement, full replace. That make your pipeline to be very simple and very easy to maintain. Try not to figure out, oh, which field actually got changed. Don't worry about that. Just grab the whole thing, send downstream, and replace it. So now in the sync, we'll have a core, same setup. It's very simple. Um, so I'm opening up the wrong thing. So the sync configurations. For the sync configuration, let's do, um, let's look at the flow. So the flow is simple. I grab something from the input. And I want to aggregate, because instead of saving one record at a time to my destinations, I want to do some kind of correlations. I grab a whole bunch of messages comes in. I want to do reorganizing them and, and maybe partition them, whatever. I want to regroup them. And then when I save to final destination, I want to do a batch put or batch remove. So then you have message handler coming over here. So after you do some kind of aggregations, I want to handle the message, right? So this is where Spring Cloud, if you ever work with Spring, uh, Spring integrations, Spring integration has a, it's basically implementation of enterprise integration pattern. If anyone will be interested, take a look. It's really cool stuff. Uh, it provides a, 
it mentioned a lot of different components, splitter, router, uh, aggregator, and all those kind of things. So Spring Integration provides implementation for this and, and, and framework for it, so you just need to wire it up. So I'm going to say, I'm going to have aggregator going to take the message. Uh, I'm going to say, because it's aggregating, so it potentially can get into starvations. The message comes in, I will say, you're going to have some kind of rule to say, when should I release the message to the downstream process? I'm going to group a whole bunch of things together. And I want to do some kind of correlations. Should the message be able to group together and go out? Now you can say, but you, you do not want to keep on waiting for the message to come in. You will say, I'm going to have some kind of timeout. So when the timeout reach, if I get into starvation issues, I still can be able to release. Uh, you can even say release on partial and based on the timeout, and once I release, it's complete. So it's basically setting up the spec of how I want to release my uh, group message. Then you can, over here, then you provide the real aggregator implementations. And it's annotation based. So you just say aggregator, correlation strategy, and release strategy. So release strategy is very simple. You just say, how, at what time you want to release the messages. So aggregator is going to take incoming message and keep going to do correlations. You can say, once I reach a certain batch size, I'm good. I'm going to release it and let someone else to handle the message. Correlation strategy is meant to be, I have a whole bunch of messages comes in. They might come in different orders and different purpose, but I want to regroup them, reorganize them. So I want to re regroup and reorganize my message come in based on my source, source key and source group. And when I say I want to do on source key, I basically take a hash code, so hash code on the source key, and I do a mod, which will give me a good partition chunk, and then you can have this uh, group count to be externalized. So basically, you say, I have a set of messages come in, I want to organize based on the, the key, and I want to do uh, and also the, the source group, and I want to break it up into the number of queues and chunk and, and do, uh, send it out. So this is your correlation strategy. And over here is, is basically the aggregator. So when the message is ready to be released, here's the rules on how you want to release your actual final data. So uh, for, for the aggregator, is a whole bunch of rules. Uh, based on, again, I'm looking at the message header, the group, and key. Then I need to, to do the extractors uh, of, to do final transformation to my final key value pair on how to send to, to geo. Then I have, I have some kind of data wrapper to say, okay, if my payload actually has a payload, uh, I will put into a map. Just key value map, so because a map, uh, I do a pre-aggregation, so when I do a gem file put, I do put all. And I'm gonna have a key, if, it, if I don't have a pay, if I have a payload, then that key should not reside in a key for remove. However, if I don't have a payload, I need to remove the data from the, the key map because you know, data coming in order, I want to make sure that I taking care of this consistency, I remove the data from the put, and I put the key into the set, keys that need to be removed. So after the message you need to be uh, sent it out, then you can have geo handler. Very simple. I just say, based on the source key group, I grab the actual distributed hash map from my uh, client server configurations, and I just say, put all. Everything I had from that, uh, data wrapper, I just say put all. And anything that needs to be removed, I just say remove all. And that's it. So now coming back to the, to the message queue. So we talked about a little bit on the, so we also have the uh, app over here. Here is the definitions of how, you, how many, if you want to do concurrency, how many instance count you want to have, and all the other necessary configurations. So you can have a group count, you can do a batch size, you can do a batch timeout. So you can do this tuning and all those kind of things. We'll also talk about the destinations, right? So what's the destination names? Uh, the, the, let's see. The group name and destination name. So those are the representation on the RabbitMQ. That's, that's where the topic name is. So, so when you say a destinations, that's a topic. The same thing as a Kafka topic as well. But in RabbitMQ, so you can say a group. So I have a consumer group. So in the, in the Rabbit, RabbitMQ's world, it's actually a queue name. Uh, in the Kafka world, it's just consumer group. And have a different uh, file offset. 
Right, so here is demonstrating that I actually have an error, and error can actually go into the letter Q. You can actually look at the errors. And you can do retro aspect because they also have the header code and all the necessary information and so on and so forth. All right, really cool. So now I can do some live data over here. So I'm going to make some data change. I'm going to say delete uh, and, and stuff like that. So before I do that, we can say, uh, very quickly. So we're going to do customer order first. So right now I have three customer order record available in there. So now I just want to say do an actual delete on the record and commit, simulating a different kind of uh, operations. Right. And I can just come back to here. My order become two, close to real time. Really awesome and can be scaled and so on and so forth. So now I have very simple deployment in the dev environment. Assuming you want to do, you're going to, you want to deploy this for load testing. You want to do tunings. So now what you can do is all those applications, everything that we talked about, uh, let's go back to the, the processor, right? We can look at the settings, environment variables. So now you can have the everything that we talked about, finding input consumer concurrencies, right? Those kind of attributes. You can actually change this on fly and just do a restock. So in your load and performance environment, you can do like a really big data load into a synthetic, a synthetic record into your event tables. Then you can start to tune this options, right? On fly, and we can go to the sync operations. Same thing, environment variables. You can change your batch timeout, your batch sync size, and, and group count in real time, and then without to stop your testing. Just stop and restart your process so you'll be able to see, tune your process. And let's say if you have some kind of uh, uh, monitoring or so metrics or Spring Cloud data flow that has metrics, uh, look at metrics of your different uh, part of processor, you can actually do that. Right, so make your DevOps experience and, and testing experience and, and everything become very simple. So other than that, just the, the one thing I do want to show, if you want to, you can write an integration test. So I have integration tests that take, in, take into account of all those configurations that auto wise of all my bind, binding interface over here. So let me maximize this. You provide your configuration over here. You're simulating it. So I'm going to, so I'm going to have some test data available for H2 database. Uh, and H2 database SQL files available in the resources. Right, so creating schema over here. Oops, you open up in over there, but coming back. So I have, I have a whole bunch of test file over there, right? Then you can set up your source, right? Then you can say, source, I write something out, make sure it's not null, doing some kind of check of my result, make sure it's in there, put into the processor, then check something out, make sure it's good, put back into the sync. I go to my gem file to make sure the size is good. Then you can write, you can test out different kind of combinations of query if you want to. So this is one I say I want, only want to focus on customer. This one focus on customer order. This one focus on item. Or I have one that just do everything. So this is an example that actually does everything. Really flexible and you can change, change how you want to do things uh, without too much of effort. So far, so good. I know I'm going really fast because a lot of stuff I have to cover. Any questions? Done? Okay, sorry. I think I'm going over time. All right, so if you have any questions, just chat with me and I know afterward. Round of applause for Anu and Jeff.